Good morning and welcome to Science Says. My name is Tom Lynch. I'm the President and Director and the Raise Beck Endowed Chair here at the Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. It is terrific to be with all of you this morning. And I want to thank our event partner, UMC. UMC has been a, a partner of the Fred Hutch for 41 of our 46 years. The company has built, serviced, supported many of the state-of-the-art facilities that you see here at the Fred Hutch, where our scientists make life-saving discoveries. And I, I want to just point out the most recent um, addition to what we have, which is the COVID-19 Clinical Research Center. As many of you know, when COVID hit, um, what we found was that there were great facilities for doing trials, clinical trials and, and, and uh, treatment options for patients in hospitals. Uh, but the problem is by the time you got to a hospital, you're already either on a ventilator or you're close to a ventilator or you're amazingly sick. We knew that for antivirals to work best, they work best when they're given before someone gets that sick. And yet there was no facility where we could actually enroll and treat patients in that kind of fashion. And so uh, UMC stepped up and uh, and and uh, help to uh, create our COVID-19 Clinical Research Center. And it was an accelerated timeline. I, I believe it took about uh, six to eight weeks um, to convert this building, which was being used, a uh, really important building for our clinical research enterprise, which we moved to another area, and we're able to create a terrific clinical research center, which we're going to use, continue to use for COVID, continue to use for drug development, vaccine development, and monoclonal antibody development at this COVID center. And so when we think about our response to the next pandemic, and we all saw um, uh, at the uh, at the G7 meetings um, in, in England this weekend, um, the leaders of the G7 countries talked about how we need to be better prepared the next time around. And part of that, I hope, is gonna come from the UMC um, uh, enabled COVID-19 Clinical Research Center. Um, also, UMC employees, help fundraise for the Fred Hutch and sponsor events like this uh, throughout the year. So thank you so much for all you do to support our research, working here and, uh, and through your philanthropy. So today we're gonna to talk about curing cancer for all, increasing equity, access, and diversity. And when, when you come down to it, this is, I'm probably, uh, not probably, I've definitely been enrolled for about 16 to 17 months. And recently we've been doing some strategic planning at the Fred Hutch and thinking about what the next big challenge for the Fred Hutch in cancer is. And we obviously have a strategy in public health and we have a strategy in, in, uh, in virology and infectious disease as well. But we were thinking about our strategy in cancer. And when I asked some of the best people at the Hutch, you know, what would you do if, if you had unlimited access or unlimited resources to, to, to fight cancer? Um, people came up with all kinds of things about you know, you know, I'd invest in cell therapies, I'd invest in precision oncology, I'd invest in targeted oncogene-directed therapies, coming up with some really great scientific ideas. When I turned the question around and said, okay, if, it, if you absolutely, if your job depended on reducing cancer death by 5%, what would you do? Everybody came up with the same two things. One, they would make sure that we did more screening, and early detection for everyone, and two, they would address cancer disparities. Now, these were hardcore molecular biologists who said the fact that you've got so many people dying of cancer that we're not seeing dying in other areas, there's got to be something we can do to improve that outcome there. And that's one of the things that, that I think drove home the importance that, that diversity, equity, and inclusion is important, not just for the social justice reasons, which, don't get me wrong, those are critical. Those are critical. But it's really important for us as a cancer center because of the impact it makes on the diseases we treat, like cancer and COVID and HIV. So I think that that's really important to, to, to drive that home. And today's science as topic is curing cancer for all, increasing equity, access, and diversity. As many people know, this has been part of our, of our, of our research for quite some time. It's not new to the front hutch. We've had people working on cancer disparities uh, for years. Um, and you know, when you think about it, there are real inequities, both in the, in the delivery of cancer care and in the understanding of cancer in different population groups. And we'll talk about that today um, uh, with some researchers who are working on the front lines of understanding cancer in this setting. I want to bring your attention to two recent reports from the Fred Hutch, which underscore how true this is in our backyard. 
The first uh, was out of our Office of Community Outreach and Engagement, which initially was started by Dr. Betty Thompson and is now led by Jay Mendoza. And you're going to hear from Jay uh, today. Uh, Jay's study found that black patients have the highest rate of cancer death in the 13 counties in our western Washington catchment area. And American Indian and Native American patients have much higher mortality rates for breast and blood cancers compared to national rates. So we see that even in Seattle, even in the hotbed of scientific advancement and, and, um, and, and innovation, we still have this major gap we've got to fill. The second study looked at the impact of COVID-19 on underserved cancer patients was led by Scott Ramsey, who runs our high core unit here at the Fred Hutch. Scott is a fantastic cancer outcomes researcher. And Scott's study showed that the number of Medicaid patients with cancer who died at home without hospice care increased by 11% during COVID. Now, Medicaid uh, uh, patients is a, is, a, is a surrogate marker of socioeconomic uh, status. And what it means is that patients who are insured by Medicaid are not getting access to, to, um, to hospice. And we know with cancer that hospice death and, and using hospice at end of life is associated with, with better outcomes, better care, more humane care, and it's, it's important to do that. So we know that we need to work um, uh, to improve this um, in, in Washington as well as in the rest of the country. So today you're gonna hear from four Fred Hutch researchers we're going to talk about the different ways that they've tried to approach the problem of equity uh, and diversity in cancer care. Looking forward to a great discussion. Please use the Q&A feature. We have a dedicated Q&A section at the end of this. Um, I also have a, 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 a brief interview that I did with Dr. Paul Buckley uh, that we're going to share as well. So first, I'd like to bring Jay Mendoza, uh, who's our first uh, speaker. Um, Jay is the director of the Office for Community Outreach and Engagement, or the OCOE, which focuses on ending health disparities and reducing the risk of cancer in underserved communities in western Washington and in the Yakima Valley. He's the associate program head of our cancer prevention program. I also want to say that from my perspective, I'm, many of you may or may not know, but we also have a large NIH grant which supports cancer research here at the Hutch. And it's kind of the way that the National Cancer Institute evaluates the Hutch and follows the Hutch. And they have a whole series of criteria by which they review us. And one of the most important criteria is how do we serve our community? And Jay leads that effort for the, for the Hutch through the, uh, through the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. So his work is really, really important. And it's getting attention from the government and from review committees who come in and look at the Hutch and they can say, you've got a spectacular um, uh, cell therapies program, you've got a fantastic bone marrow transplant program, but are you meeting the individual need of the patients in your catchment area? And Jay, coming back to your article, and your article specifically looked at our catchment area, and you found this increased uh, risk. How do you think, to, just thinking about our grant submission and as we get ready to, to report to the National Cancer Institute, how are we gonna explain the fact that, that this is happening in the backyard of one of the nation's best cancer centers? It's a great question, uh, Tom, and I appreciate your, your attention to this important uh, matter. Um, well, just like you know, many other places in the country, you know, there are great discoveries being made here, but those discoveries are not reaching um, all um, populations, especially those that are uh, underserved um, by our healthcare system and our research, um, our great research system. Um, as well as we are, you know, there's just not enough representation within our um, biomedical and um, uh, health workforce, um, which helps um, to bring people into um, those systems, make them feel comfortable in engaging with our health system and engaging um, uh, with research studies. So those are um, two kind of very big structural issues that we are um, uh, working on. Um, to, to make um, the, the very exciting discoveries um, at the Fred Hutch available uh, to everyone. And so, um, uh, Jay, so what are, what are some of the reasons for the, for, the, for the difference that we see in outcomes um, uh, across different uh, uh, racial and ethnic groups in the U.S.? Sure. So um, th there's many reasons. I, I can't get into all of them, but here are, here are just some highlights. So there are disparities um, in risk factors and behaviors that underlie 
uh, risk of cancer, such as um, you know rates of smoking, which in our catchment area are many, many times higher among um, indigenous populations. Um, there are also um, higher rates of obesity um, among um, uh, Hispanics, um, African American, and indigenous populations as well. Um, and then there are uh, we also see disparities in cancer screenings. Um, if you're not able to, you know, come in early um, for, for cancer screenings, then um, you may present um, at a later stage and have more uh, a difficult uh, course of treatment. Um, and finally, um, there are, of course, socioeconomic inequities um, that um, impact how people are able to come in and access um, care and research, including disparities in income education, um, health insurance, and then more downstream um, uh, disparities in food security, um, housing, um, and just basic um, uh, um, dignity. Um, so the, the kind, those are kind of the basics, right? Food, shelter, and what I would argue, dignity, or um, uh, being you know, free of discrimination um, and bias. Um, and so, and, and more recently, what we've seen with, especially with COVID-19, is um, just um, the, the large issues of structural racism being, um, you know, um, um, impacting um, the COVID-19 pandemic and disproportionately impacting um, underrepresented um, populations. Um, and so, those are those are some of the big issues, and um, they're 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 big issues. They need to be tackled at the societal level, at the institutional level. Um, and um, at the individual level as well, and um, I believe that at the at the Fred Hodge we are we are trying to t you know contribute to all of those to addressing um, all of those different levels. And so Jay, one of the things I know from our Cancer Center grant that's very important, and from your work that's very important, is the work you're doing in Eastern Washington to improve outcomes, principally in Hispanic communities which are underserved in that area. Tell us a little bit about the Sunnyside program and the work you're doing in the community in the Yakima Valley. Yeah, so this is this is one of the Fred Hutch's um, kind of unknown and unheralded um, uh, groups. Um, we have, as, as as you know, we have a site in Sunnyside, Washington, which has um, four or five, depending on you know the number of studies, four or five community health educators. Um, they're all bilingual, um, bicultural, um, uh, Hispanic, um, and um, they um, they've been working in that community for decades. They have built um, uh, trust. Um, they um, they are well known, well regarded, um, and um, they um, not only do community outreach um, on cancer prevention, cancer screening. Um, especially to underserved populations in the um, in the lower Yakima Valley, which you know, as you know, is a majority um, Hispanic. Um, but they they also um, uh, implement NIH funded uh, research studies um, and uh, studies uh, other studies done by our uh, by the Fred Hutch, including uh, some of the COVID nineteen studies. And um, they are able to. Um, uh, really um, bring in uh, participants who otherwise may not participate in our research because you know they're so far away from uh, the Fred Hutch um, and so um, they're, they're, they're truly um, one of our um, uh, shining gems let's say. Um, Great no I really it's it's the ability to impact um, uh, additional parts of the state is, is incredible it's very important to us here at the Fred Hutch and you and I have been talking a lot about this one of the issues for, for those who are, who are joining us today is when they think about a cancer center, they think about what the catchment area of the cancer center is. And we get patients from all over the world, but we have to make a de declaration to the government as to what area is our core area. And this year, we're making a decision to move from just the 13 counties in eastern Washington to include the entire state of Washington, understanding that we also have a special relationship with Alaska a special relationship with Montana and Idaho. Jay, do you want to make a comment on that and why you think that's important and how that might influence our work? Yeah, so the Fred Hutch, you know, we have, of course, um, we, in some ways, the, the world is our, <laughs> is our catchment area, right? Because we draw on people from all over. But um, NCI rightfully is, is um, asking cancer centers to basically take care of people in their own backyard. How are you doing it? Are you watching, are you, are you monitoring uh, the cancer burden there? Um, and do you have programs designed to address the cancer burden uh, for those folks in your backyard? And our backyard, as you know, is the 13 counties in Western Washington. 
Um, and through our, you know, through discussions, through looking at data, it really appears that we should um, uh, encompass the entire state of Washington. So we should be Washington State's NCI designated ca comprehensive cancer center. Um, this would um, bring a lot more resources, especially on cancer prevention and control to the rest of the state. Um, and it would allow us to reach uh, many more underserved populations, including tens of thousands of indigenous um, people, um, hundreds of thousands more um, Hispanics, um, and hundreds of thousands more um, rural patients, or sorry, rural um, people as well. And so those are all priority populations of NCI and Fred Hutch. And so this would be a great opportunity to, you know, to, to, to ex basically expand our backyard um, and and to um, take care of those um, all throughout Washington State. And Jay, I want to thank you for the work you're doing. You're going to be back for some questions in just a second. Next, I'd like to bring on Dr. Stefan Wallace. I've had the pleasure of working with Stefan extensively throughout the uh, COVID um, pandemic. Uh, Stefan is the Director of External Relations for the COVID-19 Prevention Network and the HIV Vaccine Clinical Trials uh, Network. His work is at the intersection of public health and social justice with a focus on ensuring key stakeholders and communities that bear the greatest burden from disease can participate in solutions to try to cure that disease. And for those of you who are, uh, just, just to highlight one of the great accomplishments that Stefan and the CoVPN accomplished earlier this year, uh, you may have noticed that, that there were six, and they, they used to be called Operation Warp Speed, I now think they're called large federally funded vaccine studies. I think the word warp speed didn't go over well uh, with Madison Avenue, but um, but there were these six large vaccine studies. The first one was not done through the through the collaboration of the Fred Hutch and the diversity of the patient population. What did not reflect the population in the U.S. The next five studies were done with the input from the CoVPN, and we were able to achieve populations of patients in the study that reflected the population of the U.S., which is really important in terms of being able to address, has this vaccine been studied in people like me? Can I expect side effects that may be different, similar? How do I have confidence in this? And Stefan was a huge reason uh, that that was able uh, to happen. And so I guess the question, Stefan, the first one is, is how did you accomplish that with the COVID vaccines? What did you do and how were you able to, to do something which a lot of other people were not able to do? Thanks, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to connect. Um, I think my colleagues and I were really successful in starting with just meeting people where they are and listening to the concerns of communities, listening to the concerns that people have about the healthcare infrastructure, about research, about past research abuses in specific communities, as well as current and contemporary experiences that communities often have when they engage medical systems. Uh, so starting there and building from there, building trust, enhancing trust, uh, partnering with key community leaders across the country to help provide uh, the message and help shepherd the uh, the messages that were created, uh, which were also created uh, in partnership with communities. Um, but we we leveraged a lot of, I would say, assets from our work in HIV and HIV vaccines, um, specifically our work in community engagement to really do uh, the important work of, of uh, supporting the enrollment and recruitment for the COVID-19 vaccine trials. And Stefan, one of the questions I would have is, is, in my mind, you didn't just wake up and do this. I mean, you've been committed to this for your whole life. And how important was the experience that you had in the HIV uh, vaccine world uh, that allowed you to be able to bring that to COVID? Would you have been able to do this for COVID had you not had the kind of credibility, connections, and, um, and uh, presence um, that you've developed in HIV. Tell us a little bit about that relationship between the HIV work and the COVID work. Sure. Um, I, I don't, to answer directly, I, I don't know that we would have been as successful um, had we not had the experience in HIV space. And that experience extends through our relationships with faith communities and groups across the country, um, historically black medical colleges and universities, 
um, key community organizations and advocacy groups um, and, and other strategies that we've used in the HIV space. We've been doing this work a long time, as you noted. And I think in addition to leaning into the relationships that we've established over the years, we also, it was really important that we build new relationships with new communities, new groups, and leveraging the relationships that we've built over time to support the building of these new relationships as well. And this has been really helpful to help spread the message, to get the word out, um, and to also ensure that we're not just communicating the message, because oftentimes people may see us as the, the scientists and researchers that uh, they may have some concerns about, but, but also ensuring that community leaders and members that people can identify, we call those people trusted voices, to ensure that those persons are also communicating the messages and sharing this information. So, Stefan, I'm going to ask you a hard question now, and I'm, I may be wrong about this. I want you to correct me if this is wrong. So, my reading suggests that our vaccination rates in communities of color lag behind our, vaccina our vaccination rates in white patients. Is that correct? It is true in many, in many areas that that's the case. And one of the concerns I've heard is that um, – People say that's all due to vaccine hesitancy as opposed to vaccine access and ability to get the vaccine. In your opinion, what's the biggest reason for that? Is it many reasons that we've got to be able to address? How do we close that gap? Thank you for that. Um, I think that the question is, is or the answer rather, is multifaceted. Um, I also want to just offer really quick um, for those who are listening, oftentimes when I hear the, the term vaccine hesitancy, it denotes that there's a problem or a, a misbehavior on the part of the community or the, or the people that we're seeking to get vaccinated. And really, the problem isn't with these individuals. The issue is with the systems and the structures that they're engaging, that have not been kind to them, that have not established and built the trust required to facilitate these relationships and facilitate the comfort level of people being able to go in to be vaccinated. So um, I think we need to look at this from, from different angles, for sure. Um, and, and as you mentioned, I think we definitely need to, uh, to attack it and to address it from different angles. And, and I hesitated to use the word hesitancy because there's almost an implication of blame. Yeah, uh, sure. and, and it's almost something like lets us off the hook. Oh, you know, people are hesitant. They've chosen not to take it, uh, as opposed to examining the why and the access part of that as well. So thank you for that. And la last question for you, which is, you know, we're a cancer center and a virus center and a public health center and a basic science center. Um, you've done really well at increasing the participation of communities of color in our viral studies. Uh, the NCI looks carefully at this for our cancer studies. Stefan, what are some of the lessons learned that we can apply in cancer that could make a difference? I think normalizing cancer screenings would be a huge benefit to communities of color and other communities who are underrepresented in this way and who may also be overrepresented by, by cancer burden in their communities. Um, and part of this could be the, uh, the inclusion or integration of trusted voices as messengers in communities and also building out infrastructure uh, it, with support and resources to ensure that people in communities don't have to go very far for their cancer screenings. They don't have to travel uh, great distances in order to, to learn more about cancer and to determine how it may impact their life. And finally, I'll close with saying that I think it's also really important that we think about people as whole beings and not just harbingers or carriers of disease. And part of the way I, in which I think that's really important to, to think about or to do is to, to sort of wrap around cancer and health screenings and, and other things with other things that people may be interested in socially. And communities are, are best positioned to help drive how that can look and how to structure that. Stefan, thank you. We'll be back in just a second. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Ricky Peters. Ricky's a molecular and genetic epidemiologist and a pioneer in using large data sets to improve and customize cancer screenings. Her research focuses on the interplay between genetic and environmental factors in colorectal cancer, as well as the impact that inadequate data from underserved racial and ethnic groups has on risk prediction. She also leads the Genetics and Epidemiology of Colorectal Cancer Consortium, or GECCO, 
the world's largest molecular and genetic consortium that focuses on identifying genetic risk factors for colorectal cancer to create personalized screening strategies and hopefully one day better drug uh, treatments as well. Ricky, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. So I guess the first question is, um, you're working on improving risk predictions in racially and ethnically diverse populations for, car for uh, colorectal cancer and also I understand a little bit for cardiovascular disease. Tell us why this is important. Thank you, Tom, for this question. This work is really at the core of precision medicine, where we use genetic data to identify individuals who are at high risk to develop certain diseases like cancer. However, through our long-standing work in racial ethnic diverse populations, we were one of the first to uh, demonstrate that we have a serious problems, as we are less able to predict um, the risk in some racial ethnic groups, like African American and Latinx uh, people. So why is this and how can we fix it? Let's take colorectal cancer. Over the last decade, our team has brought together the majority of genetic studies that have been done for colorectal cancer, and we now include over 100,000 colorectal cancer patients with very detailed genetic data. This allowed us to identify over 200 genetic variants. Each um, of these 200 genetic variants increased the risk of colorectal cancer a little, However, as these are very common in the population, and there are so many, together they start to matter. Now, each individual carries a different number of risk alleles. And there are some who carry a lot of these risk alleles and have a very high risk of developing colorectal cancer. If we identify these individuals with a high risk, we can, um, they can benefit from frequent screening and earlier screening, so the polyps can get removed before the cancer develops. However, the big problem here is that the vast majority of the research has been conducted in individuals of European descent, and to some extent, East Asian descent. If we now try to use these genetic prediction models in other racial ethnic groups, they do not work as well, meaning the predictive power is not as, weak, is, is not as strong. So therefore, it's critical that we include all racial ethnic groups when we build these genetic risk prediction models. To do this, Charles Cooperberg is leading efforts in cardiometabolic diseases, and we have been able to bring together a very impressive number of diverse populations. Unfortunately, for colorectal cancer, the number of studies conducted in racial ethnic groups have been much more limiting. So just to summarize, building trans-ancestry risk prediction models is critical to ensure that we are not increasing health disparities because it is important that we're not implementing precision medicine tools that work better in non-Hispanic white people. Okay, and um, Ricky, you and Chris Lee recently just got a very nice award from the NIH to start a translational research program in cancer disparities. Um, tell us a little bit about what the award is and what do you think, what resonated with the NIH and why do they want to fund this here at the Hutch? Thank you, Tom. I'm very excited about it, to talk about this really new program. Um, this all really started when I started to work with Panine Peterson on her dissertation. Panine, now Dr. Peterson, an Alaska native person herself, educated me about the very high rates of colorectal cancer in Alaska native people, which have among the highest, if not the highest rates of colorectal cancer in the world. This information is often hidden in cancer statistics because cancer rates in Alaska Native people are usually reported together with American Indian people who have lower rates of colorectal cancer. Then I was approached by researchers from Alaska if I would be interested in helping to better understand these high rates <clears throat> as they keep hearing from the community that this was a particular concern to them. Um, it was clear that these high rates could not be explained by access to screening, given that substantial efforts had already occurred to increase screening rates, and they were on par with the U.S. average in terms of screening. I was fortunate to start working with investigators on the Alaskan Night of Tribal Health Consortium, and together we uh, were able to get uh, financial support to generate some important pilot data. And that allowed us to be competitive for NCI funding. So with this newly funded NCI program, we are also now collaborating with investigators from Oxnard Health Systems in Louisiana and Cedar Sina from California to also include African-American patients who also have higher rates of colorectal cancer, as well as Latinx patients. 
Our current re research focuses on understanding if there are differences in the expressed genes and the gut microbiome across racial ethnic groups and if these impact survival. This will allow us to identify novel targets to better treat colorectal cancer and discover predictors to identify patients who are at higher risk to die of colorectal cancer, so they could benefit from advanced monitoring and, and treatment. Of course, this is just the beginning, and we aim to address many more research questions. Ricky, thank you so much, and we'll be back in a second um, to, to when we have the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Next, I want to introduce uh, Jean Chowning. Jean is a Senior Director of Science Education at the Fred Hutch. This is something that many people might not know about, but the Fred Hutch has a great program for educating basically everyone. We start with kids in middle school, and we go all the way up to postdoctoral fellows and faculty development. Um, so our educational in infrastructure is incredible. And Jean Chowning is responsible for so much of it. Um, she oversees our um, undergraduate and high school students, and as well as is influencing teachers. I, for one, have a daughter who is a assistant principal for science and math at a, high, at a middle school in, uh, in Dallas. And the importance of innovative curriculum development, particularly in sciences, is something that my daughter has told me is needed. And I'm delighted to see, Jean, that we're doing so much uh, in this area. And for over 25 years, she's focused her efforts on improving science education and promoting equity for underrepresented students. I should tell you that my daughter's school is a 95% Latinx school in inner city Dallas. So, uh, Jean, I guess the first question for you is, um, our portfolio of science education and training really covers the whole gamut, but you focus on the younger end of the spectrum. Tell us why, give us some examples of, of how that work is, is, is going and how meaningful it is. Yeah, good morning. Um, we do have a lot of programs. Let me start with our program for teachers, which is called the Science Education Partnership. It connects middle and high school science teachers in Washington State with the research and resources at Fred Hutch. And this is a big year for us. It's our 30th year anniversary. So a lot of institutions have programs for students, but um, our longstanding commitment to teachers, I think, is something very special. Um, so teachers participate in a three-week summer workshop. Uh, they engage in our curriculum. They participate in a mentored lab research experience with scientists in Fred Hutch Labs. And then afterwards, they have access to our kit loan program including biotech equipment and supplies for as long as they're teaching. So if you were to walk into our lab space, you'd see over 120 of these large crates with resources to conduct different types of biotech experiments. And each kit has up to 300 items, all the way from little tubes, chemicals, water baths, uh, up to you know, fancy high-tech equipment. So students are doing really exciting things in their classroom like that. Uh, analyzing DNA and manipulating it, working with bacteria in a safe way. Um, but the resources we provide to schools are ones they could not ordinarily afford. So for example, our gel electrophoresis kit um, contains over $10,000 worth of equipment and supplies, and that's well outside the budget of, of uh, many science departments. Um, so, of course, if you work with a science teacher and in influence their practice, there's a ripple effect uh, to hundreds or even thousands of students over the course of their careers. And um, we uh, calculate that our SEP teachers who are active right now reach over 15,000 students annually. Um, so we have a really broad reach. And, um, you know, I think that points to the importance of not only fostering the next generation of scientists, but also ensuring broader public understanding of and support for science. Um, one thing the pandemic has shown us is the critical importance of a public that, that values science and can use science for decision making about health and other areas of their life. Um, I think this, this, this program sounds incredible. I think what you need to do, it needs to be brought to scale and involve teachers from Texas. I think it should well, go national. You no, know, actually, actually, it's it's great that you mentioned it because the pandemic has has um, pushed us to be creative in certain ways, and so we do have a virtual um, program this summer where we have invited teachers uh, from across the country, and this is the first year that we have teachers participating from Hawaii, from Michigan, and that's opened up new possibilities for us. In addition, we have um, a lot of curriculum work that's going on. And several of our curriculum units have an equity and justice 
centered focus, including uh, work related to health inequities in cancer and COVID. And those curricular materials are freely available um, to teachers across the country as well. And so our reach has really been expanding um, beyond Washington State. So Jean, one of the things that people always ask about programs, and, and particularly in education, um, is this issue of how do you measure impact? How do you tell Jean that what you're doing and what we're doing at the Fred Hutch is making a difference? Yes, yeah, so um, we do uh, a lot of data analysis and gathering uh, outcomes data. We have a lot of uh, federal grants that we're you know, collecting information from, but a lot of it too is the stories that people tell. And so um, we, I'm also very proud of our internship programs. Um, they explicitly focus on students who've often been underestimated or systematically excluded from science. And we recognize the incredible energy and talent and insight that these students bring that we need in the next generation of scientists. So we um, very intentionally try to develop programming from early high school all the way through college graduation and provide opportunities for long-term engagement and relationship building. Uh, colleagues leading this work include Dr. Beverly Torx Storb, Dave Vanier, Julian Simon. And um, so we see our students staying connected to Fred Hutch and to science. So for example, all the high school science interns have gone on to college and about 20% of them have come to be employed at Fred Hutch afterwards. Our summer undergraduate research program found that nearly 80% of their alums were working in science or were in graduate or medical school. And internships turn out to be life-changing for many students. For example, a high school student from Quincy, Washington, which is a rural area, Roberto, he went through a high school program, two summers of undergraduate internships, and is now working as a lab tech and wants to work in public health. And there are many more uh, stories like that that we don't have time for. But I want to um, highlight that we had a wonderful recent finding from our alumni focus groups. Not only do students report a strong sense of belonging, at Fred Hutch, but they also have become advocates for health and medicine in their communities. So their families and friends look to them to translate the science and serve as credible resources for information about the pandemic and vaccines and cancer and so forth. So Jeannie, thank you so much for the work you're doing and, and please stay because we're gonna be having our, our, uh, our panel discussion in just a second. Very, very much appreciated. So I wanna next uh, uh, share with you a quick uh, video that I did with uh, with Dr. Paul Buckley. Paul is the Fred Hutch's Vice President and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. He leads our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, he's doing a remarkable job here at the Fred Hutch um, and uh, spearheading our efforts to make the Hutch's science and culture more diverse and, um, and inclusive. Paul is on the leave right now um, with uh, on on uh, on leave for um, uh, waiting uh, for for hopefully a new addition soon uh, to the Buckley family. Uh, but uh, and, and he would have been with us if there wasn't a pretty darn compelling reason uh, to not be here today. Uh, but I was able to talk to Paul before uh, before he left for parental leave. So we, if we can play that video. We'll come back and then have the panel discussion. Thank you, Paul, for joining us to discuss the efforts you're leading. Wow, this has been quite a year. It's been quite a year for you. It's been quite a year for the Hutch. Uh, tell us, what is the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion doing now, and, and where are you, and, and, and where has it gone from, from when you came uh, 18 months ago? You and I started uh, within about 10 days of each other in February of uh, 2020, and, and who could have imagined what went under the, what happened to our society between then and now? Right, right. So much has happened, Tom. Um, and in terms of this work at the Hutch, um, so much has happened for the good. It's been really a, an incredibly positive year in centering uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in our work um, as core values, core principles, and we are building on, building on and building out the practices of DEI, so um, I'm really excited. As you know, we um, delivered our annual report last week, um, uh, and that reflected a lot of the work that we have done in our four core areas um, uh, of our DEI framework. Um, they involve uh, research, 
um, bringing disparities research to the center of our discussion, and also lifting up the research that is done um, by underrepresented minority scientists. Um, workplace development, and uh, that is focused on our recruitment, our retention efforts, um, success efforts uh, with our workforce, um, our workplace climate and education. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work there and our community outreach and, and strengthening our partnerships in the consortium and beyond. Um, so we are <laughs> at this point in June, um, we are looking forward to some downtime from all the work that we've done over the last year, year and a half, which has done a lot to, I think, push the culture um, of inclusion um, at the Hutch to really engage folks in developing a critical awareness of DEI principles, um, thinking about the variety of topics that relate to that, thinking about how the world around us and all the issues that have really come to the fore, um, how that impacts um, the, the climate at, of the workplace, how that impacts our science. This work must be collaborative. The only way we can be successful in delivering and engaging um, in co-building um, a an, uh, an anti-racist DEI uh, framework and initiative and program at the Hutch is if everybody is involved. Right. right? That's, that's how it works. Um, so uh, uh, I, I hope people really appreciate um, the tenor um, uh, of that collaboration as well as the texture of it as we as we move through this process. It is also a process, and I want to highlight that. Um, and, we are moving step by step. And I think, Paul, that's such an important thing that, that I've learned uh, through this process this year is how deep our commitment needs to be on an ongoing process. This isn't something that, that's going to happen in a 12-month period or a 10-month period, but it's going to be something that's going to be necessary to be part of the culture and fabric of the Hutch as we move forward. And I want to thank you for everything you've done um, to uh, help enrich uh, the Hutch and, and bring us to a place where we're beginning, just beginning, we're not there yet, but just beginning to have the kind of discussions, conversations, and engagement that we need to have uh, to make ourselves a better place. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Tom. And, and, thank, and thank you, Paul. Very much appreciated. So I'd like to bring Stefan Wallace back for our COVID corner segment. And this will be a, a chance for us to ask some uh, pointed important questions on COVID uh, to Stefan. So um, Stefan, tell us a little bit about vaccination efforts um, and how, how well the vaccination effort is going in Seattle and in the US. Um, and, and where do we stand now? And are we close to President Biden's uh, goal of July 4th 70%. Is that going to happen or not? That is a, those are really good questions. Um, uh, as of June 10th, which are the numbers that I can, I can see uh, in King County, we are about uh, 2.7 million do doses administered. Um, about 76% of residents ages, 20, uh, ages 12 and up have completed one dose and about 66% have completed uh, the full series. Uh, in the U.S., the numbers look um, very different <laughs> as a whole. Um, based on CDC numbers, we're at about 52% of the U.S. population with uh, one dose and about 43% uh, fully vaccinated, and that's as of yesterday. So, um, yeah, we still have a ways to go. And Stefan, with the rise of variants that we've seen with the Delta variant and uh, other variants of interest that appear to be more infectious, whether they're necessarily more um, pathogenic is, is probably varies from variant to variant. But it, the good, and that's the bad news. They're appearing. The good news is vaccines appear to work against them. Um, and we, we seem to have pretty good protection, particularly for the Moderna and, and, uh, and Pfizer vaccine. So if we don't get to 70%, is there a worry that the new variants could emerge 
and and we could see uh, infections begin to rebound once we're through the summer. Because if you remember last summer, infection rates in the U.S. were pretty low last summer overall, and then when the fall happened, boom, um, it took off again when the weather got cooler. So tell us a little bit about what what some of the concerns may be if we don't get to that critical vaccination rate. I, you know, you you touched on them, and I think the, the, the biggest one is about variants and, and what we may see, uh, as you described, when various, when, vari when viruses mutate, um, they may take on other characteristics, right, that may make them more complicated to, to fight. Um, so thankfully, many of the variants that we're seeing, um, the vaccines have uh, some degree of effectiveness against them. Um, but that may not be the case if the virus continues to uh, circulate in our communities. So that is certainly one concern. Another concern is is that uh, communities that are um, uh, that have lower vaccination rates are also some of the same communities that have higher burden regarding cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that we've seen last year. So I, the other concern that we continue to, to hear and to, to think through is what does this mean for those communities? And those are often communities of color, um, people who uh, have uh, low wage paying uh, jobs with, uh, you know, less benefits, et cetera, multi-generational households. Like, what does this really look like for, for these communities um, and how might these variants that may pop up later if vaccination rates don't pick up um, be impacted further. And and um, again, thinking about vaccination rates, um, when do you think we'll have vaccines for, right now we have vaccines for 12 and above. When do you think we'll get vaccines for children younger than 12? Uh, has the COVPN been working on trials in that patient population for that people population? Uh, no, actually, we we have not been involved in, in those efforts. Um, what I do know is that there are two studies happening with the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines that are looking at children under 12. Um, and we will learn more about how these vaccines work and, and specifically how they work with this with these group, with these young people after the studies have been completed. OK, and then the last question is when do you think we'll get the full FDA authorization as opposed to the emergency use authorization? Yeah, the what I understand about the uh, full FDA review is that there are a couple of companies that have started the application process, that's Moderna and Pfizer. Um, so this is sort of yet to be determined. Um, the companies need to submit full applications with uh, a lot of data. Like I said, Moderna and Pfizer have already started to do this. They've already started submitting some pieces, but they need to complete their application. Um, I understand that other companies are definitely considering uh, a, a full submission after they also do uh, the additional data analysis uh, to complete their packet. So it's really hard to say at this point. Um, I know that there's been a lot of messaging floating around uh, potentially saying that it may happen toward the end of this year. Um, but we'll just have to see. Stefan, thank you. And if I can bring everyone back, we can do our Q and A for the uh, for the time that we have remaining. I want to bring back uh, Dr. Ricky Peters, Dr. Jeannie Chowning, and Dr. Jay Mendoza to join uh, Dr. Wallace and I. Welcome back, everyone. Great to have everyone here. And please do not hesitate uh, to use the uh, Q and A uh, uh, function. So my first question is to Dr. Ricky Peters. So Ricky, what do we know? Colorectal cancer is something that you focus on and have done uh, terrific work on uh, in your career. What do we know about outcomes in colorectal cancer um, by race and socioeconomic status? Um, is, do, uh, tell us a little bit about that and tell us a little bit about how understanding the genetics of this disease can help possibly help that. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so we know that rates are higher in African-American people and Alaska Native people compared to um, the average of the United States. Um, and um, they don't, they also have higher rates of dying of colorectal cancer. And that also includes 
Latinx people that have higher rates to die of colorectal cancer compared to the average in the United States. Um, so there is a clear health disparity and um, certainly um, access to screening is an important um, question. I have uh, brought this up for the Alaska Native people. This is not the explanation for the high rates because there has been tremendous effort um, to increase rates over the more than a decade. Um, and um, but for other ratios and groups, African Americans, it is possibly that, or it's likely that um, that um, the screening is an important contributor. Because for colorectal cancer, we have a really good screening tool. We it's um, we cannot just detect the cancer early. We can also kind of intervene before the cancer happens, because with a colonoscopy, we can identify the precursor lesions of colorectal cancer and take out these lesions out before they develop into colorectal cancer. This is, of course, a, a, a very important step for, you know, for most cancers, we don't have this opportunity. So um, it's really critical to increase the screening rates for sure. But it don't, these ones don't explain everything. And you know, you're pointing out to genetics. You know, one way to identify is to identify people at particular high ri ri uh, risk. There is there's a big shift in earlier onset colorectal cancer, and that for that reason, there has been um, discussions about in lowering the screening age for everyone. But there's also the possibility that that can increase health disparities because there's then. 22 million more people would want would be eligible for getting colonoscopy screening if we lower it from 50 to 45 years, and that is can, can become an access problem. How many colonoscopies are um, are available? And um, for that reason, we thinking you know bringing in the genetic information when we have models that work for all um, can help identifying those at particular high risk and can be benefiting from early and more frequent screening. Thank, thanks, Dr. Peters. So this one's for Jeannie Chowning. Um, Jeannie, two questions for you, Jeannie. One's come in from the, uh, from the question line and one I had. So first question is, what's the optimal age to engage young people in science? Is there a time when it's too late? If you had your druthers and were in charge of everything, what age would you start with science engagement? And the second is, uh, one of our uh, participants wants to know if you're partnering with local school districts. So those two questions for you. Yeah, so, you know, I think people, young people are natural scientists. Anybody who's observed young uh, children knows that they're questioning their world and they have a lot of insights and they're asking why. And um, so it's important to keep that alive in students and um, so I think the younger, the better. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that middle school is an age where students do make some decisions about um, how they imagine themselves for their futures. And, um, you know, so we, we do bring in middle school students um, on tours and visits. Uh, we do have some spaces at Fred Hutch that are safe for um, students under 18 so they can have a kind of experience at Fred Hutch without being in a lab with dangerous chemicals. Um, but it's hard to do uh, the sustained program with the younger students. But uh, really, I think that's part of why we're trying to work with students all along the age spectrum and try to continue to keep them involved as they move along, because we want to, to start young and, and keep going with them if possible. So I think uh, middle school is a place that I'd like to explore building more in the future, for example. and. Um, the, for younger students, the early high school students, um, we have some programs that just introduce them to Fred Hutch and what's going on here with the hopes that they'll see, you know, this is an interesting place. It's exciting. I, I can imagine myself here. We have a, a new computational biology program that we're starting up this summer for younger students um, to try to, to introduce them to possibilities in, in that area. And so we're constantly thinking about um, how we bring in some of the young and Jeannie, the second part of that is, are you partnering with any local school districts? Yeah, yes. Um, so those are the main districts that, that we partner with um, because of the nature of a lot of the equipment and supply loan. It's, it's 
across Washington State, but really focused on local school districts. Local and, district. Yeah, and and a lot of times um, it's in partnership with their career and technical education efforts. Um, a lot of districts have uh, biotech courses, for example, that we can help support. Um, but yeah, uh, very strong representation of districts uh, locally. And so, um, you know, always looking for, for additional uh, collaborations though. Yeah. And, and, you know, I see somebody who's sort of chomping at the bit here, because what I didn't introduce is that Jay Mendoza is actually a pediatrician at heart, okay? And so we've been talking about children, and, and we haven't gotten the opinion of a pediatrician. So, Jay, I'm going to toss it to you for two questions about pediatrics, okay, not about outreach. The first is, um, tell us a little bit about your philosophy about vaccinating children and what you think is going to happen with COVID vaccine in children. And then when do you think is the right time to engage kids in science education as a pediatrician. Wow. So as a pediatrician and parent, I can I can maybe speak on on, on many of those things. So um, with regard to science education, I, I absolutely agree. Like the younger the better, and kids are just naturally uh, curious. They're not they're natural scientists, let's say. And so it's a matter of can we harness that energy, enthusiasm, um, and you know really. Um, uh, show them that this is this is a way forward, and this is actually a, a, one of the most enjoyable parts um, of school. And so, I really appreciate uh, Jeannie and colleagues um, your your remarkable efforts to um, really foster um, a love of science um, in children, especially um, reaching those that are underrepresented in science as well. Um, with regards to vaccines, um, I, have the, I have the privilege of working at um, Harborview Medical Center, which, as you know, is the um, safety net uh, public hospital for King County. Um, I'm in the general pediatric clinic, so vaccines are one of our big things. Um, and we have um, among, um, we have very competitive vaccination rates, um, even though our population um, comes from lower income families. Um, and um, I think, um, and, and is um, uh, we have a lot of immigrant and refugee families there too. Um, and so I think what, why we are successful in part is, you know, the staff, um, the providers, the medical assistants, the nurses, they're all very dedicated. They all take um, vaccination education and outreach. Um, they all take it as part of their mission. So it's not just any one particular person. And then the, the, what are you, the social norm of our clinic is, kids get vaccinated. Um, right. And we also work with faith leaders to um, address any questions that may come up because of um, um, uh, barriers or concerns um, related to specific faiths. So yeah, we, we, it's a remarkable program and um, I'm very honored to um, uh, be able to talk about it here. Jay, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panel, a fantastic discussion. You know it's a good discussion when we don't even get to half the things that we were supposed to talk about. So thank you very much. I wanna thank everyone for participating. This is the 12th researcher roundtable we've done since the pandemic began. Uh, more than 5,000 people have attended these, which is absolutely terrific. And I'm excited to meet many of you in person, hopefully soon. I want to thank UMC, our sponsor of today's event, and everyone on this call who's helped make their work possible through their generous donations. I want to remind everyone, this is obliteride season. Um, there is... Uh, lots of opportunities. There's no excuse for not participating. If you want to run, you want to ride, you can even read and get credit for Obliteride. And pursuing whatever activity they'd like to raise funds for cancer research. As you know, funding from the National Cancer Institute um, and from the viral, uh, from the uh, from the Infectious Disease Institute covers about 70% of the cost of doing research at the Hutch. The other 30% comes from the people on this call. Um, and you can sign up for Obliteride at www.obliteride.org and save August 10th and 11th, to say, save August 10th at 11 a.m. for our next Science Says. We'll bring back a panel of COVID experts for a conversation we're calling Back to the Future, Navigating Work, School, and Well-Being in a World Transformed uh, by COVID. In the meantime, stay healthy and safe. If you haven't been vaccinated, please get vaccinated and we'll see you in August. Bye-bye.